Hello and welcome to the CBB Super Show brought to you by the FTN Network. I'm your host, Walter Waddell, a.k.a. Dub Deuces 85, the niche sports connoisseur and CBB aficionado. We are joined tonight by our good friend, Adam, who is uh, a little, you know, down after the North Carolina loss. And for good reason. I mean, that was a tough one. Uh, but we are going to be talking about a little, we'll, we'll go over, you know, today's games a little bit, hash it out. But we are going to be covering the four-game day two of the Sweet 16 slate, which DK and FanDuel took their sweet time putting the pricing out. I had a really bad feeling that there was going to be softer pricing because of their long wait, and it did seem like that came true. So we're going to have a probably a higher scoring slate here from the first look of it. We will be doing our tried and true method game-by-game -game analysis from a DFS perspective. We'll talk about prize picks, props, and any betting opportunities. Please, everyone, come together. New viewers of the show and veterans, smash that like button. You are definitely supporting us a lot, and we appreciate that, but we need a little bit of help there. The YouTube algorithm, you know, impressions, engagements, all of that stuff is a tremendous help with the advent of March Madness and all of the, you know, attention that it's getting this month. Uh, you guys have been pushing our show to the top, especially when it comes to DFS and fantasy content. So I appreciate that very much. Adam, it is a, a somber mood here, but we're going to push through. I was a little upset because of a different reason, because I, I, I played too much Iowa State. Um, we had the nice calls on UConn. Uh, North Carolina was looking strong early. Rondo Baycott doing his thing. RJ Davis not shooting very well, but Cormac Ryan was. And then all of a sudden it seemed like, we had weird rotations, Kadu and Trimble not playing, you know, Grant Nelson having the game of his life, which, you know, I did not see coming. Him against a, a legitimate P5 front court, he never has games like that, but he did. You guys shut down Mark Sears, but in the end, it wasn't enough. What's the overall feeling, you know, uh, uh, that you're that you have right now? And keep in mind, you know, my team didn't even make the tournament, so you're still doing better than me. Yeah, I mean, of course, the feeling is pretty somber, like you said, disappointing. I think uh, a lot of times with with college teams that you follow, you you kind of identify with the players <clears throat> and you see a, a kid like Armando Baycott, who played five, six years forever, and uh, he won't won't get to hoist that trophy. And for somebody who played the way he did for so long, so consistently at a, at a star level uh, to see him go down like this unexpected, you know, it all takes is one game. Your career can end. We saw that tonight for for uh, Armando Baycott. I feel for R.J. Davis, too, having a floor game tonight. Probably one of his worst games, ironically, in the same building as Caleb Love, who also had a poor game. I think they combined like 0 for 18 from three, the two of them tonight. But uh, it, it remains to be seen if R.J. will come back for North Carolina next year. But certainly disappointing. I don't think they expected to lose in this round. I didn't expect them to lose in this round. I thought they were going to pull it out once they took the lead late. But credit Alabama for just making the plays down the stretch. They were actually the tougher team. They made a little less mistakes in those final four minutes and really deserved to win. But I, I didn't see the Grant Nelson explosion coming either. So that, that stings a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, the the whole – all the hype was, oh, this, this sets up for that North Carolina versus Arizona matchup. The committee, you know, they picked this because they want to see Caleb Love against his former team. I didn't really buy that. Obviously, like, you know, they, they have matchups in mind, but uh, it's not as if they had planned for that. Uh, and, unfortunately, we get neither of those teams in the next one there. And, yeah, I definitely – this is that time of year, man, where, like, it's win or career is over for a lot of players. There's a lot with still a COVID year. Like I'm, I'm kind of confused on some players who have avail like eligibility left and some that don't. Some have played six years and still have eligibility somehow. Transfer portal is blowing up, but we do know for sure Armando Baycott is done. 
which is unfortunate. Uh, really would have liked to have seen him win this regional, at least get to the final four, but uh, doesn't happen. Still going to be one of, considered one of the greats, but obviously in that next tier behind guys like Psycho T and others. Uh, Davis has that option to come back. Caleb Love, believe it or not, has the option to come back, but I don't, I don't know. He might be just demoralized to the point where he doesn't want to play college basketball anymore. We'll see how that shakes out. Um, Alabama, you know, they did a really nice job on Alabama on Mark Sears, who had like 16 points in the first half, ended up with 18 total for the game. Aaron Estrada had a nice one. Ryland Griffin had one of his better games, but yeah, that Grant Nelson just hard carrying 24 and 12, five blocks, just completely unfathomable. I will say Hubert Davis rotations got a little bit weird there. Like I expected Elliot could do to barely play. He can't defend all that well. He's a youngster. He can't shoot. Remember they were sagging off of him. He hit his first two. And then all of a sudden it was like, he couldn't make any shots played only 13 minutes. So I figure, okay, Seth Trimble's got to play 25 to 30. He only played 11. Uh, we saw 15 minutes out of Pax and Wojcik. And I, I have to question that. Probably not the reason that they lost, but Jesus, that's a pretty pretty tough you know uh, decision to make there. Uh, have have you seen about anything about about that by any chance? Just be, I mean, as soon as that game ended, I took a little time to kind of just you know unwind and didn't even really see the end of the the second game because I was a little disappointed. But did you see yeah. any news about Trimble? I didn't see anything at least when I had last checked why he wasn't out. If that was just a Hubert coaching decision, or if Trimble was banged up, or yeah. Uh, you know what? I didn't, I didn't actually look. Um, there was a, the, you know, when you, when you just kind of glance at it, there was people asking where he was, but, uh, yeah. there wasn't, there wasn't like a specific reason. I think it was just like, you know, maybe he offensively, he was worried you had enough shooters hat. Maybe it would have been different if RJ Davis was on his, on his game and in his bag, maybe they could have played Trimble. Who's a little bit more limited offensively like could do. Um, so it could have been something like that, but, uh, I, Paxson, oh, shake 15 minutes just isn't the play there. So the good news is the transfer portal is massive. So if they're going to go looking for some other players here, they got to they gotta go after the Dalton Connects, not the Paxson Wojcik's. And I know that's sometimes harder than it looks, but, uh, you know, they've got a nice group coming in. Another year of Kadu and Trimble. R.J. Davis, like maybe Davis just goes the, the Baycott route and says, you know what, that, you know, NBA, maybe I'll be like a G League type of guy or, or back of rotation type of guy. I can get paid NIL money more so, you know, for this, this last year, be the king of the, you know, the campus and come back and play one more year. They still, like I said, have the transfer portal that they can look to. They're probably going to lose somebody like Zayden High, maybe not. Um, and then Harris Ingram, if he decides to come back. So a lot of interesting moves there for North Carolina. And all summer long, we're going to be doing transfer portal shows and, and talking about that. Uh, the other matchup, another game that really, it shocked me was the Iowa State versus Illinois game. Just from start to finish, the way that the Illini controlled that game, not only like – like you would figure, okay, if Illinois is going to beat Iowa State, it's going to be through an offensive explosion. And they did score 72. And Terry Shannon, once again, 29 actual points. But it wasn't really their offense that impressed me. No one else really did much. Marcus Domask, for the most part, was contained. They – defended the best I've seen Illinois defend. And I, I kind of, you know, in jest said, wow, this is the best they've defended since Deron Williams was around. I, you know, I'm kind of joking about that, but I have not seen them defend at that level all season long. Granted, Iowa State's offense isn't anything special, but they just demoralized them. They were hitting key shots. They were forcing, it almost looked like the way that Utah State, and obviously it wasn't a blowout, but the way Utah State's offense was so inept against Purdue, I got those vibes with Iowa State. The only thing is that Iowa State's defense still came up clutch and shut everybody else out. It was just Terry Shannon who did really well. Scary thing for Illinois here in the next round is that they shot 52% from the foul line, 5 of 10 for Terry Shannon. Going to have to clean that up if they're going to advance any further here, but kudos to them making an Elite Eight, knocking out the Cyclones. A man, Kashawn Gilbert, did end up putting up 30, thankfully. Had a bunch of steals. That helped us out there. Uh, but, yeah, Illinois advancing was not something I expected. Did not think that North Carolina was losing. I thought, I think Alabama's on borrowed time. Clemson continues to move on. Shout out to Mike Randall, who at the beginning of, you know, the end, or I should say the end of Selection Sunday, he confidently said Clemson to the Final Four. I like Clemson. I thought that was a pretty wild take, but now he suddenly looks like a genius and all that stands before them to the final four is a Alabama team. But you know, this is setting up for Alabama and Clemson to beat each other up. UConn to do what UConn does and just strangle whoever comes out of there. And yes, 
I don't need to, I shouldn't assume that UConn's going to beat Illinois, but I've said this steadfastly since day one, like literally once the tournament ended last year, I said, who, it doesn't matter who leaves UConn. They're going to get guys in the portal. They're going to recruit. Well, this is a dynasty. Their championship windows open for three to five years. Now I'm starting to think it's going to be open for longer. They're not going to lose. They're going to win the title. It's pretty evident to me. It's the way that they made their second half adjustments. Jade on the day worked Donovan Klingon. That's a pretty concerning type of thing. If they were to run into Purdue, I would have some worries there. Uh, but their second half adjustments on the day, holding him to under, to, uh, I think he scored less than five points in that second half after scoring 16. Very nice outing there for UConn. Cam Spencer did his thing. Tristan Newton, a solid game. And that just shows you, man. I had recorded a video earlier today uh, about Cam Spencer. Didn't get out in time, unfortunately, I schedule-wise. But uh, I had talked about, you know, hey, this UConn team, Donovan Klingon had a game. Tristan Newton had a game. We haven't quite seen that Cam Spencer game. If Klingon has a rough one, watch out for Cam Spencer. And that's just what exactly happened. And this UConn team being as deep as they are, if Klingon has a bad game, that would be a death sentence for 85, 90% of other teams out there. For the Huskies, it's not. They have Diara. He looked off the second unit. He looked like he could have been a starter for a multiple 300 plus teams out there in the country. So this UConn team is just nasty. They have crazy depth. They have guys next year coming in. They have Jalen Stewart, who uh, Hurley is basically on record in the media, begging him not to hit the transfer portal. Pretty wild times that we live in. Uh, but with that being said, UConn, Illinois, Clemson, and Alabama moving on to the Elite Eight. Congratulations. We're going to get into this slate here. We still have a team. I see our our, our man Alex in the chat there uh, talking up the Wolf Pack. We still have some, some, some hero teams left, the America's teams, and NC State definitely is one of those groups. We're going to jump into the slate here now, starting off with this first game, which is NC State versus Marquette. Total of 151 and a half. Marquette's about a six and a half point favorite. Respect to the Wolfpack. I just will not doubt them. I do. This is a similar situation to Clemson. And a lot of people aren't giving them credit, NC State, that is, like teams did for Clemson. But I think that the spread in favor of NC State is live. And I do think they have a chance to beat Marquette. One thing with Marquette, they seem to struggle with the interior. Oso Igadoro has defended well this year, but he just doesn't have the, the overall girth. Might be tall, but he doesn't have the muscular structure to deal with somebody like DJ Burns. And Mo Diara is somebody who can absolutely, we know, just own the glass, rim protection, muscle people around. He's not exactly a, a heavyweight himself, but he's good enough to get it done in all facets of the game. One concerning bit was in the Colorado game in which Marquette did eke it out thanks to a hero performance by Tyler Kolick and some clutch shots from Cam Jones, but they really struggled against Eddie Lampkin. He had 13 points and seven rebounds, but there were times where he was completely unstoppable in the post. I do worry about Burns' conditioning issues. How many minutes can he actually play if Marquette pushes the pace here? But this is going to be a very interesting game. As the co-host, you get first crack. Tell us about this one. Who are some of the options that you like? It's a pretty solid game environment. I mean, just looking at the prices, pretty soft. You mentioned that already. Uh, Kolek at 8-4, he barely got a price increase after after the game he had against Colorado. So I, I definitely like Kolek. I think they will try to push the pace because, you know, DJ Burns running up and down the court. The best way to get him out of his offensive rhythm is to maybe get him tired, though we haven't seen him kind of crack to that pressure quite yet. But uh, yeah, Kolek I'm definitely looking at just because he runs the show. I mean, he just does everything right, whether it's making the right pass, Taking over, he he's got that that hook shot that he's able to put over the defenders in the paint. And he's putting it over like seven footers, and they can't block it. He's just got such excellent touch on that. So just a great all around player. Not much of a price increase. Certainly interested there. Cam Jones is a GPP play just because he can explode for forty points. I mean, we saw him. He was in foul trouble against Colorado. If he wasn't in fo foul trouble, he might have put up forty plus. And then on the NC State side, Diara, he's just been like a monster on the glass. And I, and I expect that to continue. Seven three is a reasonable price to pay for him. Definitely has double-double upside. DJ Horn, I think we've been waiting for him to kind of have one of those explosion games. I know he was banged up in the ACC tournament, but, you know, the, like you said earlier, this this could be the last game for them. I expect a big performance from him at 7K. And then, then you got DJ Burns at 6-3. Definitely can go there as well. Those are pretty much the guys I'm focusing in on for this one. Yeah, and I just 
it really like uh you know we were monitoring refs like ref assignments the the refs that were selected for the sweet 16 that list came out we don't know what the actual game assignment is until much closer to game time even though they know that ahead of time I wish they would release that earlier but it's probably like a betting edge or something i don't know um and we didn't see james breeding's name on any of the games today we made it through all the way so he's going to be refing one of these games here i have a sneaky suspicion that it's going to be purdue gonzaga uh, but I really hope it's not NC State Marquette because he's absolutely going to demolish this NC State front court if James Breeding is officiating this one. And if you don't know by now, everybody who played DBFS or fantasy or bet on games knew how bad Bo Borowski was as an official. Goes down as one of the all-time worst in collegiate history. Thought everybody came to the game to see him. Called the ticky-tackiest of fouls. Just an awful, awful ref. Ruined many DFS nights for me. Decides to retire. We have a parade. It's great. But now we have this, this dude, James Breeding, who thinks that he's the new Bo Borowski, and he just prides himself on ruining games. So I want to throw that out there and make sure that everybody's aware, and I'm going to do my best to get those ref uh, assignments there, you know, as close or, or as before lock time as possible. Uh, but that's going to affect me, and it shouldn't, but I, I, I'm going to be watching out because he's going to ruin one of these games. And I really hope it's Purdue for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, but, yeah, this NC State team, they've been super fun. You know, they, they gutted out a really nice win over Oakland, uh, despite the fact that Diara fouled out there in overtime. Burns just, you know, uh, an absolute clinic there. They were able to play him those additional minutes because they, they, they kept, I mean, he played 42 minutes against Oakland. Like, that's just outstanding. You never would have thought Burns would be able to play more than like 30, but he he made it out there and they were able to mask it a little bit and they were to slow it down and, and really offensively be very deliberate. Um, and that's going to be the key here to them keeping up with Marquette and being able to keep Burns on the floor. Because clearly, if they're able to run that double Burns Diara, looking at the Marquette side, they just don't have the ability to stop that. Oso will be on probably, I would imagine he's going to have to guard Diara because he he's just going to get worked by Burns. But then that means who's going to guard DJ Burns. So uh, my my you know gravitational pull has is, is got me on Mo Diara again, 7-3. The pricing is soft. We mentioned that a couple of times. I feel like Diara should be a little bit lower owned here just because it is softer and that 7-3 price might alarm some people. The DJ Burns chase at, at you know 6-3 might be evident. I feel like people would be more likely to go there. Diara does project the best of any NC State uh, option on our initial sheet there. I still have to mess with minutes, but his rates, everything has been fantastic. Playing the best basketball of his life right now. I have to keep riding Diara. The only thing that would ruin him would, of course, be foul trouble. That's the, the one thing that I'm most concerned about. DJ Horn, I think I'm going to be going back and forth about running him in my main. You know, he had a horrible 4 for 11 shooting performance against Oakland. Only 23 fantasy points in that last one. Priced at 7K. He can do some real harm to our lineups there, but clearly he's over any injury ailments. Going to play 35 plus minutes. I like the NC State mini stack here to a degree with Kolik on the other side. So he's certainly in the, con the conversation for me, but I'm, I'm kind of going back and forth there. Do you have some some sub 6K options we can consider? Mike O'Connell is playing really well. Uh, three for five from downtown against Oakland. Really confident. He's played 35 plus minutes in five straight games. He's going to be out there. High assist rate, contributes in all categories. You know, kind of hit or miss sometimes on his scoring ability, but he was shooting with confidence against Oakland, and I really liked what I saw out of him. So as five, six goes, he's definitely a last man in type of play. I'm not going to start there with him, but he's he's obviously a, a good look there and better than the five, you know, K options that we had on today's slate. I'm never using Casey Morsell, just not going to do it. If he beats me, that's fine. I'm still not using him. And, and the game against Oakland, like uh, my stepfather, you know, he doesn't really watch college basketball. And he, he was like, damn, this Marcel guy, he's pretty good. And I was like, what are you talking about? This guy sucks. Every time he touched the ball, I was like, miss it. And he was so confused about why I was hating on Marcel. Because he did have a pretty good stretch there for a minute. But uh, it soon became apparent to him, you know, why I was rooting against Marcel. And I give him the backstory. Jaden Taylor, sub 5K. He's just, you know, with Horn healthy, it's going to be tough for him to get any substantial minutes. Uh, I suppose at 4-9, if we're kind of desperate for value, we could go there. He did take nine shots against Oakland, had a respectable 20 fantasy points, but that's one of those more lean options there coming off the bench. Uh, and then Ben Middlebrooks, pretty chalky on that last slate, only 13 minutes against Oakland, fouled out. That's a, a big concern there. However, He's still worth GPP consideration. His price went up to nearly 5K, which makes it tough. But if you think Diara Burns are going to struggle, 
or they're going to get into major foul issues. Middle Brooks will have those additional minutes coming his way. He is pretty gifted offensively, I will say. It's kind of comical. Middle Brooks transferred, traded, I should say, for Jack Clark. Now Clemson is in the Elite Eight. Can NC State make it as well? Maybe it'll be the uh, the Middle Brooks you know, bowl game there in the title, Clemson versus NC State. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah. As far as Marquette goes, yeah, I think Kolick, you got to start with at eight four. If if he wasn't priced, you know, coming into this one, if he wasn't gonna be priced at like nine five, it was just gonna be an auto lock for me. And even at nine five, I still probably would have tried to run him. Played all 40 minutes against Colorado, back to back games over 40 fantasy points. Any worries about the you know five, six game layoff with injury? Completely abolished, no concern there. He's playing every possible minute. Kind of an auto double double. Maybe he flirts with a triple double. It would feel real bad to not have Tyler Kolick there. Uh, and he's just got to be considered one of the best plays on the slate. Uh, you do have some value options here. Chase Ross, he played 26 minutes there against Colorado, had a monster game. I feel like there'll be some chasing going on there. I don't like him if we think or if we end up getting, you know. Uh, a look here of everyone's talking about him and he becomes kind of a chalkier option. I think I would like to go elsewhere. Uh, but he definitely looked good in that particular spot there against Colorado. I just don't think those kind of minutes will come because you had mentioned Cam Jones got into that foul trouble there in the first half and he lost substantial time, played only 24 minutes. That's where the bulk of Ross's playing time came from. I don't know that that would be a repeater if that's going to happen. So that's a lean play to me. If you want a super sneaky type of value, Ben Gold at 3-6, he's going to have to play. Um, I think we see him play closer to 20 minutes here just out of necessity as having somebody with any kind of size out there to deal with that NC State front court. He's 6'11", nearly 7 feet, very raw prospect still. Rebounding numbers are, are, are kind of mediocre. He does have solid block rates. We've seen him have some pretty good games in the past, but you know, depending on how overpowered this NC State front court comes out, we may have to see Ben Gold play a substantial amount of time. And at only 3-6, he could definitely volume his way out there. Not somebody that's going to come out and drop a, a 30 piece or something, but maybe he scores five points, four or five rebounds, a block shot or two, something that you're feeling pretty good about at 3-6. You know, Sam Walters today didn't do a lot. Trimble didn't do a lot. They didn't necessarily kill your lineups if you had other pieces. I think Ben Gold is somebody that we can definitely look at for that reason alone. Cam Jones 7 8 is a supreme GBP play, as you said. Definitely like him. And also Igadoro. He's going to project really well because of the 7 1. I I I I don't really think he's going to break out of his little mini slump that he's here. Uh I think rebounding wise he's going to get absolutely owned on the glass. And I just have a lot of question marks about how this Marquette team is going to deal with that NC State front court. But you have Tyler Kolick, the great equalizer, and if Cam Jones is red hot from long range, it's going to turn into one of those three-for-two situations. I brought this up last night with Mike Tree on the show. Went back to that NC State, what was it, the senior night game with DJ Burns? I know you remember it well. We were oh, kind yeah. of in the, uh, the Discord. They were trading threes for twos. They just continued to pound the rock with Burns. Nobody on Duke could stop him. It was very, very obvious. Uh, it was pretty hilarious, honestly. And it was like, okay, Burns is going to have this career game. And he did almost scored 30 points. Uh, but what happened? They got basically their doors blown off 79, 64 because Duke kept hitting threes. They only shot 30%, but there were so many times they were trading threes for twos. And it was just like, yeah, they're killing it with Burns, but they're not defending very well on the perimeter. Something's got to change here. It didn't. So I, I'm a little concerned that it plays out in a similar fashion that, that Keats is just going to be like, so enamored with this mismatch and keep feeding burns. That means we probably need to have burns in DFS, but I, I just worry if that's going to be the ticket for NC state to be able to win this game. Um, a quick, quick theory actually on yeah. NC state. I know that a lot of talk about them. Oh, they can't win five games in five days. Their legs are going to be gone. They're going to be tired. They're going to be gas. I was thinking about it the other day, just watching the Oakland game. They feed DJ Burns so much where it's, they cross half court, they throw it to burns. Burns goes to work. Everyone else is just standing around. So it's like you're playing 38, 40 minutes if you're one of those starters that you're running in the ground, but you're really – you're standing around for like 15 of those minutes just watching DJ Burns go to work. So I don't know if their legs are maybe necessarily as tired as people think. It's not like they're uh, going up and down the court, up and down, up and down. There's a lot of downtime for those guys to just watch DJ Burns back down the defender. So maybe they're not as tired. Maybe that's why they've been able to make this run. 
Yeah, no, that's that's that that could be the case. Honestly, that could be the case. And I and I learned a long time ago because DJ Burns, he had some pretty high prices even into last year. Uh, and it, it was like, man, I can't pay this price for Burns. Then he would drop like a 35, 40. And it's like, okay, I, I stopped doubting him. But I, I think that, yeah, this is, that's a pretty funny, uh, and, and believable theory. Um, but I do feel like they're going to slip into that. It's just going to be like feed Burns, feed Burns, feed Burns. You're going to be hitting all these like, you know, baby hooks and these wild, like behind the back shots that he throws when he gets fouled. And, and just like, he puts on a clinic and I'm just sitting here. I've been, you know, you know, uh, last night, not as much today. Cause I was kind of like sweating the games or whatever but staring at this this matchup and just wondering like they don't have an answer for burns i want to play diara but i think wisely we should be playing dj burns he's not going to project very well on the sheet he never does even though his rates are solid it's because his, his overall usage and stuff and his rebounding rates are actually pretty middling but it's really hard to envision him not putting up 30 plus in this spot here unless he gets into foul issues of course uh somebody in the chat there asking about david joplin he has been very good in the tournament thus far, and he had a nice stretch of games when Kolik was out, pretty much hitting 25-plus fantasy points in all of those games without Kolik. Put up a 41 against Western Kentucky and a 29 against Colorado, only 6-5. Don't hate it. He is going to have to continue to shoot pretty well. Uh, I just worry a little bit there if you know if it turns into a Cam Jones shooting clinic. Kolik has taken a lot of the offense. There may not be enough left over for Joplin to produce there, and he doesn't typically have the peripherals to support a a, a bad shooting night. So he's okay, definitely, but not a not a priority play for me. All right, next one up here: Gonzaga versus Purdue. The Boilermakers five and a half point favorites. Total of one fifty four and a half. So it is the highest total on the slate. We saw the massive total for Alabama and North Carolina. What did majority of the industry do? They played four, five, and six players from that game. That might be the case here. A lot of the more casual players, uh, you know, go straight to those higher total games. Seems pretty obvious, right? Purdue, Zach Eady. It's the Zach Eady show. It was in the Utah State game. He's priced at 10-8. I really was hoping that he would come out like 12-4 years ago when Zion Williams, back in my day, when Zion Williamson would play, he was priced at 12-4, and that's like the max that they would get guys to. And he still had to use him, by the way. Uh, so I was hoping that ZD was going to get to like, you know, oh, 11-5 or something like that after the 56 he threw down, but he drops to 10-8. Um, you know, we've, we've gotten away with fading him a lot. Uh, last game, it was pretty rough if he didn't have them just because it was a little shorter slate, but you definitely have seen a lot of ED ham, but we haven't been punished all that much for it. I do worry. I am concerned that if he drops a 60 on this four game slate and we don't have them, we may not have enough elsewhere to make up those points. So what that means is we're probably going to see a lot of, even though the pricing is very, very soft, we can get a, a kind of a, a really strong balance build in there probably going to see a lot of ED still. And then a lot of those, you know, people chasing chase Ross, maybe a, a, a middle Brooks, maybe a Ben gold plays like that. There's some cheapies over on Tennessee, dusty Stromer, perhaps we're still going to see some ugly lineups. And with ED lineups, we typically see a lot of junk, if you will. Uh, so I'm pretty concerned about fading him, but I also don't want to make a, a subpar lineup there. Um, where if he, you know, he drops 38, there's still so much leverage to fading Zach, especially on a four game slate. I just, I feel like it's going to be hard for me to click his name in his teammates are all really cheap. Braden Smith at seven, two. That's usually where I like to go when I fade Edie. Yes. Different positions, different roles, but if he's going to get into foul trouble and struggle, Purdue shifts a little bit and they lean on Braden Smith heavily. You see Fletcher lawyer play better. Lance Jones is brought in to play D and shoot threes. They have some pieces here that you can run maybe a mini Purdue stack and GBP that doesn't include Zach Eady. Now we saw Trey Kaufman Wren have a massive game against Utah State. They just in the interior wise, they put up a a, a pathetic performance. Uh, one of the worst you'll see. Kaufman Wren absolutely. I've harped on this a lot, but in case you didn't know, he tore up the Euro Tour tour that they were on last year or last summer at this point. Crushed it in the exhibition game. There's a lot of hype surrounding Kaufman Wren. He's the heir apparent next in line with Zach Eady. This will be his final collegiate year. He's, he's not going to come back, even though I think he has the option to if he wants. Uh, Kaufman Wren, the, the, the guy, priced at only 4-4. He did put up 21 against Grambling State as well in the first round in 23 minutes. That's been the main problem with Kaufman Wren is he usually plays around 15 to 18 minutes. But now that we're in tourney time, Painter kind of tightening up that rotation a bit and playing his key starters a ton of minutes. And if Kaufman Wren plays 20-25 here, 
against this Gonzaga team that has some pe per, uh, personnel in the front court. Anton Watson, Graham EK, they've got the bodies. Uh, ben Gregg, maybe we see a little huff. It's not going to be as easy for Kaufman Wren, but he's very cheap there at 4-4, and I'm inclined to think that with the way he's playing, they're going to keep going to him, and he's playing with a lot of confidence as well. So before I get into Gonzaga, I want to stop and get your take on Purdue and perhaps this game all along because you're kind of with me on the Zach Eady fade train, although you're a little more passionate than I am about you know fading him or, or having distaste for him. If you are still going with what you normally do and fading Eady, or do you feel like we got to chase Kaufman Wren and and you know what else what other pieces there are you potentially looking at for the highest total on the slate? Yeah, passionate putting it lightly. Anything to do with Edie and me, but uh, I mean ten eight. It's it's cheaper than we're used to. I mean he last year is up. I think at twelve k at times he was kind of living in the eleven k range. The pricing softer, so you can kind of get to him. And if he's going to put up 60 points, it's going to be difficult to make up, make up that if you, if you fade him. But of course, like you said, there's m massive leverage. If he does struggle with fouls for some reason, or maybe just has an off game, maybe he puts up 45, 46, and then you're paying 10, eight, you're sacrificing the integrity of the rest of your lineup. So what I usually like to do is I used to just put Edie in my lineup and then make a build. And, and kind of take a photo of that in your head and then do a balance build and kind of look at them side by side and, and think what you're more confident in. Because if you play Edie, you're going to have to nail those values. There's not as much avenues to success if you're going to play Edie. So, but because of the price decrease, 10, eight, it, it might be able to be done. If you can find those values that you're confident in, a lot of these guys are priced a little cheaper than usual. So I'd at least be considering Edie in this matchup just because of the raw points. If it was a two game slate, like we've had on many Mondays in the past, it'd pretty much be a lock button just for the raw points alone. You might be able to get away with it with four games, you might have some options. You might have a balance Betty type of build that you could do, but uh, I'm going to have to build lineups with Edie and see if I feel good enough about the value to go that direction because he's pretty much a lock for 40, 50 points. And I might just have to take that. As hard as that is for me to say. Yeah. And, and honestly, it's, it's even, it's even le like he's skilled. Don't get me wrong. Like he is, he's got the post moves. He, you know, he gets it down there. He's just going to do, do what he does and score, but he just gets that, that Royal treatment. Um, the refs that, and, and there don't, there were some blatant fouls from the Utah state side, but there are also those really questionable ones and they'll let him get away with stuff. And, and, you know, the, the amount of times that he kind of drops the shoulder and, and just gets away with it, you know, that, that really, that caught some of the Utah state guys off guard there quickly. And they got into foul trouble very, very fast. And I do worry a guy like Graham EK that's going to happen because he's a pretty tough kid. He's not going to back down per se, but I don't think that the, he will get a favorable whistle. And we know that Edie will. So fading him becomes ridiculously hard because he's just going to have so many and one opportunities uh, he's going to get to the foul line probably 10 or 12 times. It's just, it's very scary proposition uh, when you're dealing with the kid who's, you know, seven, four and, and just getting that LeBron James treatment, if you will. Um, so fading him is, is going to definitely be a, a really tough one. There's people on his own team that you can line those lineups with too. I mean, we mentioned Kaufman ran at four, four. Mason Gillis at 4-6. I know his minutes have been in the wrong direction lately, but as they get deeper in the tournament, Mason Gillis is going to have a, a tournament moment. That's kind of what he does. Uh, Lawyer's there at 5-2. Jones is really cheap at 5-3. I think he's going to actually be pretty low-owned. He hasn't had huge numbers lately, but he's you know a, a Zach Eady foul game away from absolutely taking over and taking 10, 15 shots. So GPP-wise, that makes sense. But then you can go down here and look at a guy like Camden Heidi, who is another – kind of future heir apparent type of player who played 22 minutes against Grambling in their first round matchup, played 15 against Utah State. And even in the competitive games, you know, in the Big Ten tournament, Michigan State, he played 14. And then in the loss against Wisconsin, he played 16. He scored 13 plus fantasy points in three of those last four, two of them supremely competitive, two of them not, but his minutes stayed around the same. And I'm inclined to believe he's going to play 15 to 18 minutes once again. He has pretty good rates. His fantasy point per minute numbers are higher than you probably realize. You get him at a forward slot, which is a kind of a harder position to fill. 
in a near min price to where the point if if you bust, you're still going to be okay, especially if you have Edie and maybe Jamal Shedd, who we're going to talk about here in a minute. So I think Camden Heidi actually becomes main team viable as a value play. And he's a little bit more appealing than the values we normally see in that range. I think he's got more upside and a better floor than a guy like Sam Walters with maybe a little bit more of an undefined role. But he looks very confident. I got to give it as a painter. These young guys that he has, Kaufman, Ren, and Heidi, both look so confident when they're on the floor. And that just comes from great coaching and developing. Um, so those are the values that we can look at there. In Zaga's side, I'm really worried. I think this is like the Nemhard game. It's going to have to be, but I'm not looking to pay 8K for him. It'll just be a situation where maybe I'll mess with his props. Maybe I'll get a GPP lineup out there of him. But in order for Gonzaga to move on here and pull this upset, they're going to have to shoot the ball well from downtown, which is something that Utah State just didn't do. Um, they were breaking shot after shot. It got really ugly. Um, I was at DK Sportsbook watching the first half of that that Utah State game, and I was so disgusted <laughs> with the five minutes left in halftime. I just got up and like wandered off. I don't even know how I got home, but I did. Uh, <laughs> and I just I'm, wor I'm worried about seeing. Uh, and I wasn't drunk, so I hope no one thinks that that's what I meant. Um, but Gonzaga, they're going to have to have them hard hitting shots. Stromer's going to have to step in there and provide key, you know, uh, minutes. And then Nolan Hickman, who really, you know, has a capability of throwing down 20 real points in this matchup. He's really cheap at five, nine. I think he's probably in the main team conversation as well, a little easier to get to him than it is Nemhart. But I think one of those two guys, they're going to have to have the game of their life or the game of the tournament in order for them to surpass this Purdue squad. EK at seven, four and Watson at seven, seven. Those are just kind of like the prices I would expect them to be maybe a little closer to AK. I don't feel like either of those guys have a ton of upside Watson. We know he can, he can rack it up, right? Steals, blocks, rebounds, assists. He contributes in all categories, um, but he's not going to be pulling down 13 rebounds against Purdue. The assist game he had against McNeese, that was more of an outlier just because they absolutely smacked the hell out of McNeese. Uh, and his points, they they fluctuate a lot. And and he hasn't been in foul trouble lately, but he's going to have to take a turn on Edie. He's going to have to, you know, uh, take over when EK gets into inevitable foul trouble. So I'm just really worried about those two. Um, not that I think they can't physically hang with Zach Edie. It's that I just don't think they can hang with the refs and what they're probably going to do. So for me, I'm looking at Hickman and Nemhart. Hickman, more of a realistic option there. Ben Gregg at 6'6". If you do want a front court player for Gonzaga, he probably makes the most sense. He's also going to have to, you know, plug up that front court. He's shown a ability here over the last month of the season to be a pretty solid rim protector and an aggressive rebounder. So I think he's an okay price point if you want to go there. A Gonzaga mini stack in large field GBP could be the optimal, could be the winner. Not a lot of people are going to do that, even though this game is so highly total. You might see one Gonzaga, but then you're going to see Purdue stacks is what I believe you'll see. So going to that Gonzaga three or four man mini stack in large field could be a real differentiator for you and, and really pay off, especially if Gonzaga number one pulls this off or number two, it, it goes into overtime or, you know, turns into a, a offensive showcase, which it very well could. Stromer at 3-7, I think you got to consider him more than you would probably think. He played the 30 minutes against McNeese. It was a blowout. Played just 15 against Kansas. That was more of an athletic issue there. He couldn't defend the Kansas guys. They were way too strong for him. It was a liability. I think against Purdue, that'll be less of an issue on the perimeter, and you'll see they're, they're going to need his three-point shooting, and I, I, I do think he sees closer to 20 minutes in this one. And at 3-7, he makes a lot of sense there for, again, a Zach Eady build. You're looking for these various values to fit in. Stromer is somebody that you could definitely consider. I think he plays a lot more than we just saw against Kansas because athletically, Purdue's not Kansas, even though Kansas just lost. Do you have any of the good? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to oh. interrupt. No, go ahead. No, you go. I was just gonna ask. I was just gonna ask you if you if there are any Gonzaga guys that you were kind of feeling. So no, you you, you, you kind of just like we're saying word for word what I would have said. There's there's at least ways that you can stack this game with Edie just because the guards are cheap. Like you could get the the Fletcher Lawyers, you could get the Nolan Hickmans. You can make it work with Edie. You can even go with the Stromer. I'm just crossing out all the Gonzaga forwards. I, I just don't want to deal with the foul trouble. EK is in foul trouble in normal circumstances, so I can't even imagine. He'll probably pick up three fouls in the first half instantly against Edie. So I'm just crossing those guys out. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to tilt it. And there's other ways to go about it. So I, Hickman was the guy I had circled for Gonzaga. This feels like one of those games. I don't know what his ownership will be like. 
but he he could explode here. They need that outside shooting. He can provide that. So if you're going to go with an Edie build, you could just throw Edie in there and just play a bunch of guards just to get the exposure for this game. But I'm not messing with the forwards at all. And hope hopefully the value, if the Stromers, you know, maybe even the Heidi's pay off, then you're going to be sitting pretty. Yeah, absolutely. And Gonzaga does have also, you know, the freshman Brayden Huff, who's kind of gone through it. He was really good in the non-con, predictably a, a non-con hero, struggled in the WCC, lost minutes, but his minutes have been trending in the right direction, and he started to look good again. And he, he gave them very key minutes against Kansas, 18 total. He took nine shots, so he has really good rates. But he might be served as a lamb to slaughter there if, if EK picks up. Like, I could see that EK getting that first foul early and having to sub him out right away so you don't lose him and and then turning to a Braden Huff. And then that's going to turn into an, a pretty ugly situation. But at 3-9, if you're doing multiple entries, or you're playing that big GPP or the mini max, rotating through some of these guys like a Huff, even though it's it's not great, he is there at 3-9 as another potential piece. Because really all you're looking for in those ED builds is to rotate through two or three values in hopes that one of them hits 5X or combined they're at 5-6X. And you never know with Huff. He could, you know, he's very aggressive. He shoots threes. He could pay off 3-9 there if he does play 18 to 20 minutes. But uh, it's a really tough situation here for Gonzaga. And I, I, I do think that they're going to struggle um with foul issues so we'll see how that shakes out but i'm i'm worried that this is going to be the breeding game and and it's the second game on the slate so we should have we'll obviously have starters and when those come out in stat broadcast they do have the referee official assignments i try to get them on twitter ahead of time but uh, i'll be keeping an eye out for that one uh so we can make some decisions there all right, next game on the slate, Houston versus Duke. Houston a 4 point favorite, lowest total on the slate. It's pretty typical of Houston games, 134 Houston just played like the most dramatic game of the tournament to date. I mean, there was a few really good ones in those first two rounds, even though we didn't have the the normal Cinderella story. But that overtime game against Texas A&M, that was really special to watch. We saw multiple guys foul out on both sides, but Shed just hard carried in the overtime. Now they're going up against a Duke team. Duke's been called soft. They're trying to shed that label. They shot just ridiculously well in their, their second round win over James Madison, totally shell shocked them. A lot of people thought Houston would be the first one seed to drop. Turns out it's North Carolina. Still people are expecting Houston or maybe not expecting is the wrong word, but picking Houston to lose to this Duke team. I don't know that I buy it. I think this Houston team there, you know, suddenly Jawan Roberts played 33 minutes with him playing 30 plus minutes. Shed just being a, a unguardable machine in his fourth Sweet 16, believe it or not. Four years with the team, been in Sweet 16 every single year. Uh, Manny Sharp dropping 30. Like, this Houston team is is not going to go home just yet. I, I truly believe that they're going to advance against this Duke team. And that's not just because I'm a Duke hater, which you may be as well, I think, you know, with the North Carolina fandom. Um, so before I get into this game, who are some of the options that you're looking for on both sides? Because I do think at this point, we don't have to fade against Houston. There's four games. It's, it's getting smaller. We're not quite to the, the two game. Like, we got it. We just have to target against them. No choice. So you can fade against Houston. It is something that I'm still, you know, I'm not looking to stack Duke or anything, but I think there is a, a player or two that we can potentially look at here. What do you think? Well, my first question is how's Phil Pasky projecting on your sheet? Because <laughs> Phil, your sheet loves Phil Pasky. He's at the top. Actually, and I'd be curious against Houston. Is he still breaking through to the top of that list or is he? No, he won't be the top. Down? He's uh, at 35 minutes. He's like right around four one. So he's still overvalue, but he's not a, he's not a slate breaker this time because of the matchup. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm more just, I know you said we don't have to fade Duke, but I might just fade Duke. Just looking at the other three games. I, I love the game atmospheres so much more than this one that I don't know if it's necessarily worth even messing around with them. The problem with the Duke guards is I know Roach was a little beat up. It was mostly just a finger injury. They should be able to tape that up. He should be fine. But trying to play, you know, a little bit of a carousel with those three guards can get dicey at times. I know their prices aren't too bad. They're on the 6K range. I don't think they're bad plays necessarily. They're just not priorities to me. Filipowski is a little too expensive. I'm not going to play him against Houston in this kind of matchup. Mitchell at 6K. Mitchell's a guy that we like to play if we're fading Filipowski just kind of for the leverage. But I just don't really – I'm not really interested in any of the Duke guys. 
I don't know if the the value guys like like Stewart Power shouldn't see any time. Stewart's been pretty good on a fantasy point per minute basis, but I don't know how many minutes he's going to get out there if it's a tight game. I think Shire's going to want to trust the starters. So I, I don't think there's necessarily a bad play on Duke, but me personally, I think I'm just going to fade it just because I like the other games more. Yeah, and and that's, you know, I, I think that's ultimately going to be the right call. I think somebody in this Duke group, maybe even two players, will will get close to 4X, but being as, as how those other games are more, you know, intriguing fantasy environments and and the scores might be higher. They should be higher than they were today. Uh, you know, hitting four X on, on flip may not be enough. Mitchell is definitely a guy that I continue to like. I think his price of six K is too cheap, but the fact that there's so many ball dominant guys emerging on this Duke team, he doesn't always get the shot attempts and that really hurts him. And, and I, I expected more from him from at JMU. Uh, he scored 22 fantasy points with two real, which is still pretty impressive when you consider it. He's at his best when he's, you know, uh, hitting jumpers, getting to the foul line, just, you know, making things happen. And, and he's not getting those opportunities and flips, not really either. Like offensively flips look pretty pedestrian, right? He had, uh, what do you take? Like one shot in that win against Vermont, three points, yeah, he had 14 shot. against JMU, but uh, you know, he, he only shot eight times. A lot of those were bunnies. He's just not looking for his shot. So, uh, I think, you know, his rebounding numbers will be lower. He's going to have to shoot more in this game, I think, and, and not particularly efficient shots. And ultimately that just adds to Proctor chucking McCain chucking, and it's going to hurt Mitchell overall. So I like that price of six K for him, but it might be a little baity in that he's just not going to get shots up. I also don't think McCain's going to have a, a game in which he shoots 72% from long range again, eight from 11. He's not that far off. Well, it was uh end of February ish against Florida state when he also shot eight for 11 from downtown and put up a 50, he followed it up with a one for six performance after that. And, and typically that's about what you're going to see like two for seven, maybe three for 10. Like he's still going to be chucking, but I don't think he'll be that efficient, especially not against this Houston team. Um, Texas A&M, just like Radford and Wade Taylor. Those guys are like tournament made players. So it gave Houston a hard time. I don't feel that same way about McCain Roach and Proctor, even though they have been fairly solid. Stewart's kind of interesting at four two, especially after he played 15 minutes against JMU. But I think you know you're probably on to the right track there. He's going to play less than 10 minutes, and he's also a really prime candidate to hit the portal like the minute this game ends if Duke gets eliminated. So I don't know that he's he's necessarily going to be a factor there. If you are going to use anyone from Duke, you probably want to stick to that starting group. On the Houston side, uh, you know I was really. Like there was two players that were, you know, conviction wise for me. And I, and I always tell people like, Hey, I'm going to have some of the most conviction in this industry. I'm going to play who I'm going to play. I'm not going to be, you know, too tempted to play a guy I don't like that's projecting as chalk. Although it does happen from time to time. And I bitch about it when it does, but for the most part, when I really have what I perceive to be a strong read on a player like a cam Spencer today. And I also was high on Kishan Gilbert who bailed us out with steals. For me, that play is going to be Jamal Shedd, who was sub 25% on that last slate, delivered a, a really strong performance, played every single minute, um, You know, kind of got off to a, a weird start in the first half, but ultimately 21 points, five rebounds, 10 assists, just a classic game. Shedd is so good. He's a veteran. Like I said, he's been to four sweet 16s. He doesn't get rattled. This Duke team isn't going to worry him one bit playing every single minute, taking 15 plus shots, his assist rates high, steal rates high. Everything about Shed is just, you know, screams auto play and one of the top plays on this slate for me. 7-5 is too cheap. He he really should have been priced at 8-5, you know, honestly with the way he's been playing. Uh even 8k would have been I still would have been jamming him in. So that that play for me that, you know, maybe the field will be a little less on, although he played so well, maybe I'm I'm just wishful thinking. Uh but Shed's going to be a player that I have you know, nearly 100% of like Cam Spencer and Sean Gilbert work today. That's just one of those strong conviction plays that I just won't be swayed to, to go away from. So shed is, is that guy for me. They did do a, a good job of pricing Manny Sharp up slightly to six K it's, it's like that, that, you know, Walmart pricing where it's like uh 1998. Okay. $20. I don't know if I can do that. Uh, you know, it's a very minuscule price increase, but it's enough to, to make me feel like, am I getting that same bargain there? He is a, a very high variance player, right? We know he can put up a huge score like he did, but he can also really brick out. 
He doesn't have strong peripherals. That's Shed's thing. He's very similar to Cryer in that he's going to have to hit threes. He's going to have to make things happen offensively to pay off that price point. He is a great GPP look, and I, I did think about playing him with Shed on this slate, immediately clicking in both because I think at this point, mini stacks is the best approach to these smaller slates. Uh, I think Sharp's points prop is where I'll probably attack. I don't know that he'll make my ultimate line, uh, main lineup because I do have some concerns there. He also has been fouling at a high clip, which is worrisome. If he has a bad shooting night, one for nine, two for 15, he's just not going to have those peripheral stats to support it. Had he been 5K, easy luck. Maybe even 5-5, five, five, but 6K, it's just a little bit high enough to where he falls into that GPP category for me instead of main look. Same could be said about LJ Cryer at 6-2. The play I want to pair with Shed is going to be Jawan Roberts. Now, I'm not sure if Shed's going to end up being you know, this major chalk piece, somewhere between 25 and 30% max, but I am confident in knowing that Jawan Roberts at 5-7 is going to be stratospheric chalk. Um, the fact that he played 33 minutes against Texas A&M, I was really worried going into that one. You know, a lot of people were on Roberts. He was popping up in projections, optos, all that stuff. But my main worry was he's played 19 minutes against Longwood. Yes, it was a blowout. Barely could play in the uh, Big 12 tournament. He's super banged up. I need to see these, you know, at least 25 minutes from him. They played him 33. No sign of it. I mean, he was a little sore and and, and did, you know, kind of drag at the end. Um but to me, I'm pretty confident that he's going to play 30 plus minutes here, barring foul issues, of course. And at five seven, his rates with his rim protection, his rebounding ability, and his jump shooting, um, he's just a very strong play there in all formats. So I'm expecting heavy ownership on Roberts. I do want to play him, not because he's owned, just because that price is way too cheap for him if he's playing 30 minutes. And I don't, I really hope there's no setbacks. I don't think there will be pregame. It would just be something in game that would happen. Just want to, I don't want to speak it into existence, but I just want to be aware and, and that possibility exists for Roberts to play less. But I think he's he's probably one of the best plays at the forward spot because of his price point and the value uh, projection that he has right now. So Shed and and Roberts for me, we have seen more minutes for Milik Wilson, Damian Dunn, Javier Frances, all of those guys under 5'5". Five, five. Can definitely look to Damian Dunn at 4K. He has been playing more minutes, played 19 in their last one. 23 minutes against Iowa State in that uh, Big 12 final. Obviously, they got just absolutely destroyed. Uh, in their first round matchup, Dunn was very aggressive. It's not as if Dunn has forgotten how to play or he's some scrub. You know, when he was at Temple, he was a big time scorer. Um, he's just kind of waiting in the wings there for his opportunity. And and with 20-ish minutes at 4K, that that's a play that makes a lot of sense to me personally. So on the Houston side, are you kind of lockstep there? Or do you have any others that you're looking at? Or, or are you kind of sticking with this is a Houston game? I don't want any part of it. Well, I'm fading Duke, but I did write down Shed and Roberts. So I'm pretty much in line with you. Roberts is going to be mega chalk as long as he's, you know, like you said, doesn't have a pregame setback. The interesting thing about Shed is we talked about Kolek at 8-4. He's probably going to get a lot of ownership. We talked yep. about uh Braden Smith I know people will probably pay for Edie but Braden Smith's price is really it's nice it's 7-2 so I don't know maybe Shed will fly under the radar with two guys two point guards around that same price level if Shed falls under the radar and he's conviction play then we might be cooking but uh yeah I don't know I'll definitely it's something I'll have to consider I like Shed in these kind of games because of the experience because he's so ball dominant you saw in overtime when they had all those guys foul out at least before shed fouled out it was literally just give the ball to shed he's dribbling 10 15 seconds off the shot clock and then taking a guy off the dribble and attempting a shot it was just the shed show because he's the only guy that they could trust in those spots so if you're playing roberts and you want to pair him with shed that's the mini stack that we talked about that's been profitable on these four gamers so um It'd be interesting to see the the ownership projections. That's something I don't have as much access to, but I'm sure uh, you'll fill us in when the time comes if you think Shed's going to be a contrarian play because I'd, I'd definitely be on board with that. Yeah, and I think that maybe shocks some people because you know Shed's had some really good borderline elite scorers around him throughout his Houston career. And he's only really averaged, you know, like 10 to 12 points this year. He's at uh, 13 points per game. So people don't really look at him as like this, you know, go-to score. Uh, he's just been such a great facilitator. And he sets the table. But when push comes to the shove, he's able to score at all three levels. He's not the greatest 
long range shooter, but he will shoot it with confidence. Uh, he is definitely a guy you want the ball in or ball, hands ball in his hands at the end. And I think that ultimately if we could get like a, you know, a Colick shed showdown, that would be pretty fun battle of the point guards. But, uh, I think we see another game here that's going to call upon him to take over and, and score, you know, 20 plus his point props is definitely gonna be something that I'm heavily involved in tomorrow. And I also don't think that he's going to come off the floor for even a second, you know, they'll, they'll time those media breaks and timeouts to get him the, the water Gatorade, whatever, but uh, sheds just a really solid high floor player that I think puts up a, a 40 plus game here, regardless of it going to overtime. Um, I don't know that I trust Manny Sharp to drop 30 again, I think this is a game that Shed's going to be able to show out here. And ultimately, uh, I think Duke pushes them, and it comes down to the last possession or two, and, and you know for sure Shed's going to have the ball in his hands. And that puts him in an opportunity to rack up late points at the free throw line. So he's our guy for sure. All right, and then we wrap things up with Creighton versus Tennessee. The Vols just three-point favorites, total of 144. Now with this game, to me, it's, it's all about the physicality. Creighton, they – they don't like it when you push them around. They do have, you know, the the seven footer Cal Brenner. He's capable of banging with players down low, but he's a little bit more finesse. He shoots threes and and he likes to be able to dictate how things go. When you get up on him and start to push him around, that's when things get supremely uncomfortable. And we just saw, granted, it was double overtime against Oregon, but we saw Invante Dale just absolutely dominate that low post area. Twenty eight points. Um, what do you have? 19, 20 rebounds, a couple of blocks, a couple of steals, just a, a really huge game. And it, it was a two man situation there for Oregon. Jermaine Cuisinart threw down 32 as well, but I just very intrigued that every time Dante got the ball, like he was going to score one way or another, he was going to work that front, that front court of Creighton. And he did. And Kalkbrenner had a nice game too. 19 points, 14 rebounds. Again, he's going to be able to hold his own. Kalkbrenner will produce here. But defensively, I just don't have the faith that this Creighton team is going to be able to withstand what the Vols are going to be capable of. Defensively, the Vols are going to get after it, not only in the front court, um, but also perimeter-wise. Zakai Zeigler, people forget, he's an elite on-ball defender, and he's going to be causing major issues for guys like Stephen Ashworth and Trey Alexander. Now, I do trust Alexander the most here to be able to score on this team from a sheer volume standpoint, but you saw Oregon really on non-three-point field goals, he shot three of 13. Oregon did a pretty nice job, all things considering their perimeter defense wasn't that great this year, but they definitely made Creighton uncomfortable. They were able to make it happen at the end there and, and kind of think what happened, Oregon just got gassed out having re legitimately just two guys doing everything. They honestly just gassed out. Uh, I think that the Vols, they have the, you know, they have depth, sneaky depth, if you will. Creighton doesn't. And coming off a big game like that, yes, they've had time to rest, but um, they're going to get punched in the mouth early. Can they withstand it? Certainly. The other thing to consider here is the Vols aren't going to shoot 12% from long range this time. An absolute, just atrocious game offensively for Tennessee. Doesn't get much worse than that. Key thing is there, they still gutted out the 62-58 win over Texas, despite shooting three of 25 from distance. That's pathetic. Um, Zeigler was one of eight. Dalton Connect was one of eight. 0 for 4 for Ganey. Uh, Vescovi was over three, like they just could not make any shots, but they forced a ton of turnovers, 17, and they were able to turn those turnovers or make those into points. And they got it done at the foul line. As it turned into a free throw shooting contest late connect automatic Zeigler automatic. So if a similar situation plays out, they're forcing a lot of turnovers. The game's close at the end. We're going to be able to rack up some points with these connect Zeigler type of plays. So for me, I'm on the ball side, not only betting wise, but also I want to have some pretty decent exposure here. I think people will be a little bit worried about Tennessee offensively with Creighton being, you know, so good on that end of the floor, but I just feel like Zakai Zeigler at seven, six is a nice gift. Uh, while I'm not too sure about shed, I think he'll be closer to 30% than he will below it. I am confident that Zeigler is going to be next to nothing when it comes to ownership. I think we're talking about sub 10% in the cam Spencer range. And it's another conviction play with me that I'm, I'm as convinced or confident in um, that he's going to produce. So I think a lot of people here, if they're going to use a Vols player, they're going to go to connect. 8-2, it's a cheap play. SEC player of the year, high usage rate, high volume, can score at all three levels. He's going to get into it with Trey Alexander. It's going to be fun for sure. But Zeigler offers us a strong peripheral game. Not going to shoot one of eight, two for 12 overall. 
He's going to be able to make shots. The three prior games to that, he shot three of five from long range, four of 12, and four of 11. So you're seeing the volume is there, but he was much more efficient. Six of 15 overall against Kentucky, seven of 17 against Mississippi State. St. Peter's got pulled early, took six shots, made three of them. But he had a double-double. High assist rate, grabs rebounds. Like I said, he's one of the best on-ball defenders that nobody talks about. Has the opportunity to rack up steals there. Even if he makes, you know, five to six of his 15 shot attempts as opposed to one or two in the last game, that's going to push him into that next tier and potentially making him, a, you know, a slate breaker. Two of 12 shooting, but he still put up 26. A lot of people were like, damn, you were on Zeigler. He put up 26 at 7-9. That just didn't get it done. You're right, but six real points on 16% shooting to still put up 26 shows us that his floor is high. He's going to get those peripherals, and he's going to shoot better. And this is a game in which I do think he scores 20 real points. So I'm going to be on his props, and I'm going to be on him heavily in DFS, where I think nobody else will be that price. I was kind of hoping it would be 7, 8, 7, 9, 8K, just for the fact that that would keep people away. I don't want to share this play with anyone but the community. Uh, and I'm, I'm just very confident that he pans out the way that Cam Spencer did um, and just racks up points in a variety of ways. I do is really cheap at six, seven. The one thing that could potentially hold him back is fouls going up against Kalkbrenner, but I don't think that'll be the case. He has a very low foul rate, so we don't typically have to worry about that with him. He did take 12 shots against Texas. It was an ugly game. He still excelled. He had 25 fantasy points. We're talking about a lower price for him. He was seven, six, seven, eight, almost eight K just a week or two ago. Now we're getting a supreme discount at six seven, and I think people are going to overlook this one as well. So a, a a vol stack is 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 definitely brewing. Connect being the chalkier option that I don't think we have to play. I do and Zeigler being the two that I think we do need to play. If you want connect as well, you can easily play all three. You'll have to sacrifice someone. Maybe that's you know you don't play Ed up top, or you know you have to make a decision on on Mo Diara perhaps. But I'm I'm certainly going to have at least two pieces of Tennessee, and and like I did today with Connecticut, I regretted only, you know only two pieces, which was great. But damn, why didn't I have three? Why didn't I have four? That was right in front of our face. I feel like the Vols are going to be an identical spot to Connecticut, to where at the end of the slate, people are going to be like, man, I, I I probably should have had a little bit more exposure to the Vols there. This was a nice bounce back spot for them. This is a team in Creighton that they can work over. Um, so I don't want to be regretful two nights in a row and I'm, I'm locking in two vols for sure. I'll see how the lineup shakes out and what my build can, can handle as far as Dalton connect goes, because I think he does potentially put up 30 real here, but opportunity cost wise and the discounts we get with Zeigler and I are just going to be too hard for me to pass up. We do have discounts on Santiago Vescovi. He's back in play as a value at four, seven. Now, DFS wise, he hasn't been great. It's easy to forget just two or three short seasons ago. He was one of the top players in the SEC, a true alpha, putting up 35 fantasy points a game all the time. Different role, much down, you know, he's further down the pecking order. Kudos to him for accepting that lesser role and not leaving. Viscovi can blow up at any time. If Zeigler, you know, has a bad shooting night, Connect gets fouled, some, you know, things aren't working and they need a bucket they can go to Santiago. Now you might say, well, they needed a bucket against Texas and he didn't step up. Very true. I, that was just one of those games. The Vols offense was out of sorts, out of sync. They couldn't get it going. Santiago has a, a very good offensive ability. He's more of a rhythm scorer. That's the main problem. So, you know, coming in cold or, or taking a shot every like 12 possessions, that doesn't really work for him. He needs to be able to take a couple shots in a row on back-to-back -back possessions and really get into that flow. Kind of like Caleb Love. Um, so it is risky, obviously, but he's four, seven, which mitigates some of that risk definitely in play in those ball stacks for us. If you want to get real tricky, you have Jemiah Meshack at three, eight, Jordan Ganey at three, five and Tobe Awaka at four, one, all three of those bench pieces seeing additional minutes lately. Awaka was really good against Texas only 11 minutes because of major fouls, but he had 10 points and five rebounds in those 11 minutes. He's been a really good backup to I do, and they've been playing him more lately. Don't necessarily think this is a game that they will need to play him more. So I, I'm a little bit less higher or, or less on him than I am the other values, but certainly a, a consideration play for uh, an I do fade lineup with Meshack and Ganey. They're interesting. Ganey is kind of that instant offense type of player off the bench. And I think it could be a Hassan Diara type of situation where we're talking about a guy who's not been great adequate. He's very cheap three, five, and he's going to be in line for 20 minutes. That's all it took tonight for Diara. Ganey could step into two or three triples, 
grab a rebound, maybe some assists, get a steal, and boom, all of a sudden, we're talking about a 5X Jordan Ganey at 5%. Diara was like, I think he was even less than that tonight. So really kind of mirroring what we saw with Connecticut. I think the Vols run a similar way and shake out with multiple of their players being on the optimal. So uh, Ganey isn't necessarily into my main build, but I'm, I'm really considering it because looking at how he shoots, what the situation will be against Creighton. And if the Vols offense gets stagnant at any time, Ganey's going to be somebody that Rick Barnes calls upon. So he's kind of the sneakier value there for me at 3-5. Creighton, same thing as always. Baylor Shireman, Ryan Kalkbrenner, Trey Alexander. Alexander's cheap, sub 8K. Shireman's priced where he normally is around that 8K range. And then you have Kalkbrenner up at 8-7. All of them are good. They're matchup proof. You have to consider them that way. Ashworth there at 6-4. I think he struggles. So I'm not looking at the non, you know, alpha trio that the Creighton Blue Jays have but they're also not priorities for me at any point. I do think Trey Alexander sees 20% or more ownership because of his price, but that's one that I'm probably going to be lower on than the field. Balls, Blue Jays, you're an Ashworth guy. I know that. Who are some of the plays you're looking at here or uh, or looking to fade, I guess? A couple of interesting things about this game. I know there's been a little bit of a layoff, but many of the Creighton starters – Played 50 minutes against Oregon. They just did not come out of the game. I don't know if that will necessarily matter. They are a team that likes to get up and down. Perhaps a, a physical team like Tennessee can really wear them down, and maybe their legs will start. They'll start taking a toll. But uh, I'm, I'm mostly on Tennessee as well. I think you laid it out properly. I think ball dominant guards against Creighton can succeed because Creighton plays that drop coverage. Creighton never fouls. So you can kind of just walk, you know, you go around the screen and just kind of walk into the lane and take a mid-range jump shot. Um, of course, if Tennessee's up late, you could get some of those uh, late fouls and extra free throws that you had mentioned. But ball dominant guards against Creighton interests me. I know Connect will be pretty popular, but there's obviously some merit to playing him at, at only 8-2. It's at least an affordable price. Uh, on the other side, Creighton, I'm mostly off them just because their their big three is always expensive, and this is kind of a matchup downgrade for them. But Alexander, 7-9, that's lower than we're used to. He's usually 8-7-ish on average, so uh, I agree he might get some ownership. I don't know if I'll get there. I think there's enough plays throughout the slate where I wouldn't uh, end up with Alexander, but I'm going to end up with a lot of Zeigler, connect just to get some exposure Ganey, i i do like that call just because he could be that late value hammer who comes in and provides a little bit of a scoring punch but tennessee's going to be able to score in this game this this game is going to be high paced they're already a great offensive team with the drop coverage that creighton plays guys are going to be able to walk in the jump shots so i think you laid it out pretty well i adu i like his price as six seven I just, he just kind of seems like the last, the last man for me that I'm not going to get to. So I think it's connect uh, Zeigler, Ganey to some extent. Vescovy, I have a little bit of interest, but he's really just dependent on if he's going to make his shots or not. Um, but I do think you need exposure to at least two, if not three Tennessee guys in this matchup. And then if you ignored some of the plays we uh, suggested earlier, I, I suppose you could go with Alexander just because his price is right. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because the, the stacks, like we, we had this conversation all the time in the discord, like stacks and CBB is it's just a, a really, you know, profitable thing and, and people don't really do it. And the nice thing is, cause it's really hard to be right about every single play in your lineup, right? Like you're going to inevitably hit bricks. Some nights you are, you're perfect. And those are the big nights. But when you stack, you just give yourself such a better chance of absorbing. Cause when that, you know, earlier when I was doing the live cast of the, you know, live typing of the Yukon games, like caravan rebound, caravan, triple assist, Stefan castle steal cam spent. Like, it's just like, you know, just hitting every single piece, just a really good feeling. Um, and Zeigler, like you had mentioned the Creighton, the way they play their defense, like he's going to get a fair number of jump shots. And I just, I I'm playing the averages here and, and saying that he's not going to shoot 16%. I think he'll be closer to the, 40 45 percent uh mark which is usually where he shoots for uh most of the season all right so that is the slate we ran through it quite efficiently now's the time we're going to talk about cores two or three guys who are going to be in your primary lineup or majority of your builds go ahead Adam. 
Oof, let's see. There's so many options that I couldn't really settle settle on a course. So I told myself that I would just do it on the fly. Um, I don't think I can get away from Braden Smith seven two. It might just be my my Edie bias, but I I think I'm going to end up fading Edie just so that I could build a a balanced lineup filled with studs. And I think Braden Smith fits the bill. I like that game environment. It's going to be very fast paced. Braden Smith's an excellent player. At that price, I don't think I could pass that up. Just to have some exposure on the other side, I I don't know. Maybe this is more of my posh play. I know you like to designate some of your, mm-hmm. your guys as posh plays. I like Hickman at 5'9". I just I just feel a big game coming from him. I'm just avoiding the, the Gonzaga forwards. I think they're going to struggle with fouls. They're going to be uh, down in the paint getting beat up by Edie. I think somebody has to step up. Uh, from the Gonzaga guards, and I'm not going to pay 8K for Nemhard, even though he could have a good game. They need him to have a good game in order to win. So Smith is my first first guy in the core. Hickman's number two, and then I think I'm going to go with I think I'm going to go with Z- uh, Zeigler just as a late game hammer. You mentioned he's probably not going to shoot that low of a percentage, and and even if he does, there's there's still paths to success for him because of the peripherals that he puts up. I can see him easily getting. You know, 10, 11 assists in this matchup. If he just has a normal shooting game, it should be an easy double-double. Uh, I think Creighton might finally be a little bit tired here, and you can get those extra points as uh, the PMR finally runs out at the end of the night. You want to have somebody who's maybe racking up those free throws at the end. So I'm going to go with three guards in my core, actually. I'm high on the guards in this late. Yeah, definitely. And the, and the nice thing about Zeigler is it, you know, he's seven, six, we know it's, it's one of those plays where like, we know it can pan out. He's an affordable price. He's, he projects like slightly over four X at, at 38 minutes. So I just, you know, I suspect with uh, his, his performance overall, a lot of other projection sheets or the other sites that run probably won't be quite as high on him either. Um, you know, we try to blend the two projections and, and our, our, our game knowledge. So it's just one of those plays where everything lines up perfectly well. And I think he sees a, a very low ownership number. So he's definitely core play number one for me as well as the posh play. I, I don't see the ownership there. Uh, Jamal shed as core play number two, just really f- affordable prices building up to this, you know, kind of, uh, balance type of build. And then Tyler Kolek, I got to figure out a way to fit him in there as well. Three kind of upper, you know, mid-range guys, all guards as well. But I think it just makes way too much sense to get those three into your lineups. You're just absorbing so much usage. There's going to be scoring. But the three peripherals for those guys are just really outstanding. And then even Braden Smith, maybe running him as a fourth option there and just going super punt at the forward spots. So we're high on those guards. As far as forwards go and, and you know, kind of – semi course because we're gonna have to play some forwards obviously dj burns who we talked about if you've if you're able to get there trey kaufman ren mason gillis of purdue some cheaper options that you can get on Edie's own team um and then ben gold maybe being one of those sneakier value plays at forward where hey if we can get 10 out of him we're feeling pretty happy anything above that is a bonus but with the rest of our lineup five, six X plus we can make up those points somewhere else. So guard, I heavy. To throw, throw Roberts in there too. I kind of yeah. forgot about that. Roberts is, you, you almost have to play him at five, seven. Uh, I know yeah. it'll be chalky. So that's kind of why I'd, I didn't bring him up, but he's certainly someone we might have to lock in as well. If we, if we go to the fourth guy. Yeah, most definitely that price is, is too cheap. And and you're lo- looking at forward. It's not as if there's not talent there. Mo Diara, who I love, but I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to afford him this time. Edie, Calc Brenner, you know, the Gonzaga guys, I do. Like there's some really talented forwards here, but it definitely seems like the time to pay down at the position. Uh, and we do have some some reasonable options there. Like I feel as though Braden Huff is, is going to win somebody at GBP here in this slate. And it won't be me because I'm not going to use him, but man. The scenario and situation playing out could really favor him. All right, let me get into prize picks here. Last time, I didn't get a chance for you to hit any props, so I do want to give you that opportunity, but let me run through any prize picks that I'm looking at here first. Uh, we nailed the Cam Spencer props tonight. 
all of his points to Goblin, Demon, and Regular, as well as his PM or PRA and his fantasy total. Everything Cam Spencer hit, which was nice. Sean Gilbert's point prop hit at the end, thankfully. Similar to tonight with Cam Spencer, I'm going to Zeigler over 26 and a half fantasy points. And they do have a Goblin play of nine and a half points for him, which I'm also going to be hitting the over there too. And Jamal Shed over 32 and a half fantasy points. And then they have Manny Sharp at 20 and a half. There's some volatility there. His PRA when it's at 19 to 20 can be some shaky sometimes, but at 20 and a half fantasy points, I'm much more comfortable there. So I'll be taking the over on Manny Sharp's fantasy point prop as well. Similar, I'm on the same guys that I am for DFS. Go figure. What are some of the props or betting opportunities that you uh, you are seeing out there before we wrap up? It's funny. It's similar for me too. Just the guys that I cord in, in DFS, I'm looking at for props as well. I think Nolan Hickman, over 13 and a half points. I think he should be able to hit that. Uh, Zeigler, 11 and a half. I think he's going to have a much better shooting game. That's a very, uh, should be a high scoring game for Tennessee. I like that. And then there was one more that I was just scrolling through. I think Braden Smith too. I know these are the guys I mentioned in DFS, but 12 and a half points, points for Braden Smith. I think you could even look at DJ Burns. If they play Burns ball, like we were talking about, 14 and a half points. I mean, the guy shoots like 70, 80% seemingly on, on any back down in the post where he's putting up that lefty hook. So I think those are just off the top of my head that I could see. Um, I like those overs. I might tweak it as I uh, do some more research into tomorrow, but that those are the four that stand out to me so far. Yeah, and there's three on DK I'm looking at. They are all PRA since they don't offer fantasy point props, but there was a, a five-leg parlay that I made today. The first two hit, which was Gilbert's over 13.5 points and Cam Spencer over 21.5 PRA. Have it with Mo Diara over 21.5 PRA, which is plus 100. Good value there. I just couldn't pass it up. Uh, Jamal Shed over 25.5 PRA. Hit his 24.5 last time, which he obliterated. It's minus 105. Still very good value with his peripherals. And then ending that with Zakai Zeigler over 20.5 PRA at minus 125. So got those three legs left on my initial parlay. Those will be in the bet tracker as well. And there'll be some additional props that we talk about throughout the day. You'll want to make sure you're in the FTN CBB DFS Discord. We'll be posting any applicable news, lineup stuff, warmups, referee assignments, everything. We'll also be tilting and just overall talking strategy throughout the day. Before we head out, what do you want to end on? What do you what's on your chest that you want to bring up? Anything, you know, tournament related or even non-basketball related? Just just your time to to let it all out and uh, you know, sign us off with uh something awe-inspiring if you have it. You know, that just let us have a, a elite eight, a final four, and a national title game where the, the officials aren't the story. And I think I fear as long as Purdue is involved, we're going to have that be the main story in some capacity. It's funny. We're seeing it a little bit on the women's side with Caitlin Clark and Iowa. There are a lot of complaints about the officials, the free throw discrepancies in that Iowa West Virginia game. I think it was on Wednesday, a couple of days ago, but uh, you know, Zach Eady's become the poster child of, you know, kind of being in the ref's pocket. I know he's a talented player. I know he's, he's dominant. And uh, it just seems like Purdue might be on a collision course to meet uh, UConn in the final, which would be interesting. The two bigs up against each other. I think uh, maybe, maybe Edie and, and Klingon will cancel each other out a little bit, but just for gosh sakes, just let us not have the officials be the story. And unfortunately it's been that far too many times uh, in Purdue games thus far. And if, Big 10 fans of all teams have been complaining all season long in conference play. It's continued in the NCAA tournament. And uh, unfortunately, I just have this bad feeling that it's going to be an ongoing theme into the final. That's why I hope Purdue gets knocked off tomorrow against Gonzaga. And then we probably are free of any officiating controversies. Uh, maybe I'm jinxing it, but um, that's something that stands out to me. I think, just seems like one of those years where Purdue and UConn are on that collision course. And as long as that's the case, I'm sure there's going to be some fans that are uh, going to be not happy about the whistle that Edie gets. So that's something that I hope we don't have to deal with, but I feel like we will. 
and you know, with all the the technology at hand and their their you know um, uh, replays and everything, you you'd think that that stuff would improve, but it's actually somehow gotten worse. And I feel like maybe tr that's got to be like a training thing as these guys come up, or or maybe just like almost a laziness part because we're seeing some like even there was a. a I was in the Indiana state game the other night. There was a very obvious three point shot. Like he was, I don't know, a mile behind the three point mark. Uh, <laughs> and I think it was Robbie Avila and they had to, re they, they, the ref still chose to review it to make sure it was a three. There was not a foot on the line. There was it was like, there was that, like that much space and, and they still reviewed it. So I don't know if there's like, Hey, they, they're stretching it out cause they get paid by the hour or, or what, but it, and I'm of course joking about that, but there's something, you know, going on the officiating getting worse, uh, with, as technology gets better. And that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It almost seems like, you know, they're, they're get caught up in the moment. And this is something I talk about a lot, but it's just like, we're not there to see them. So, um, it's, it's really tough. They also, it's been happening forever, giving the stars, the, the, the preferential treatment. So, um, Hopefully it's it's consistent and and this will be the last of James breeding for the year. I I very much hope so, um, and I do have a feeling he's going to get that Purdue game. At least I think I hope. So we'll see how that shakes out. Uh, I just want to end on a tidbit about uh, tournament seedings. Saw this earlier from 2006 to 2019, only two number six seeds made it to the Elite Eight. It's not very many during that stretch. Clemson is actually the third team to do it in four years, Creighton last year, and USC in 2021. So even though we didn't see the big upsets, we saw a couple with no Cinderella runs, we are seeing a, a you know a, an influx of six seeds making these deep tournament runs. If Clemson reaches the final four, they'll be the first six seed to do it since Michigan, Fab Five era in 1992, and just the seventh number six seed since 1979. Some to chew on there as you're betting Clemson or or their opponents in uh, in Alabama. Appreciate it for you coming on, checking us out. I know it's it's late for you, so and and obviously coming on after your team loses never never easy. But you're a, a, a soldier for that. I do appreciate it. Still plenty of slates to work through, opportunities to do shows. So we'll certainly be hoping you have time to spend with us again. Very much appreciate the audience who continues to turn out in droves here as we talk late into the morning for the East Coasters. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow night breaking down the Elite Eight slate for Saturday right around 9.30, 10 p.m. PST, depending on when those last bit of games end. Make sure you're over at FTN checking out the Discord and all the great content that we provide. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Let's get those green screens, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>